Programming Coordinator at the Deschutes Public Library. This year we are celebrating a significant milestone, 20 years of reading together through the community reading program, A Novel Idea. The concept behind A Novel Idea is simple, pick a great book, engage with the community through thought provoking and relevant programming, and wrap up with a visit from the author. This year, as you probably know, we are bringing back four authors from previous years, David James Duncan, Maria Amparo, Escandon, Peter Heller, and Griffin. All four will be joining us in person on Saturday, April 29th at Bend High. A Novel Idea is the biggest and most successful community-wide reading project in the state of Oregon, and that's thanks to community members like you and the work of the Deschutes Public Library Foundation, the generosity of sponsors and donors, and that make all of these events free and open to the public. Am I too quiet? Okay. If you have questions uh, during the program, uh, you can put them in the chat and we'll either answer them throughout or at the end. Dr. Thomas Doherty is a psychologist based in Portland, Oregon, who has a specialty addressing people's concerns about environmental issues and climate change. His publications include the groundbreaking paper, The Psychological Impacts of Global Climate Change, which has been cited over 800 times. Thomas is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and founded one of the first environmentally focused training programs for mental health counselors in the US at the Lewis and Clark Graduate School. Dr. Doherty's work has been featured in publications like the New York Times, and he also co-hosts the Climate Change and Happiness podcast. Thank you so much, Thomas, for speaking with us about a topic that has touched not only the characters' lives in the novel L.A. Weather, but in many of our own. Thank you very much. Well, it's glad to be here. Um, yeah, I, I'm fond of Bend. I'm fond of libraries. And I'm I actually, I'm fond of the novel L.A. Weather. I, I learned about it because of this event and uh, recently finished reading it. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to actually have fun with using some of the characters in L.A. Weather as some case studies for the some of the psychology stuff that I'm going to talk about. Um, and um, I'll be pretty conversational in my talk, and I will share some slides in a minute. I know this will be recorded and things like that. Um, and I'll kind of go through material because it's really good. It's, it's, I find it's really good to get a lot of the material out on the table. And we have then we have a lot of tools and concepts to talk about. And then it's... Um, and then it's good to kind of get into a dialogue because people, all of you can can identify with this material I'm talking about and people can take it in, in different ways. And there's a lot of diversity in this. So we'll just have a nice, I'll, I'll share some things and um, I'll try to track the, track the chat if people are putting in the chat. And I might ask, I might ask some questions that you all can, can respond in, in the chat. Um, and then Laurel will also help keep us on track here. So um, let me share my screen. Let me have some slides. Well, anyway, I do want to thank Laurel and all the staff and patrons of the, of the library. I, I live in Portland, Oregon. Myself and my family are power users of the library. And so I think it's just a great, um, it's just a great institution. And I, and I love the idea of people getting together and read, you know, massive book book club like this and talking about things. Um, yeah, and I'm going to give you a little preview about some of the work I do, which we'll talk about in more detail as we go. But, you know, I am a psychologist and I have done psychology for years and I've worked with people, you know, on different kinds of life issues. Um you know, kind of regular things you might imagine a psychologist would work on. And then uh, more recently, I've I've specialized in this climate change and environmental area. And people are often curious about what that looks like and how that translates. Um, so I'm going to share, I'm going to share an example um, uh, just to get us started. Um, and this comes from life in Portland and probably similar Somewhat similar in Ben, but this was life in Portland a couple of summers ago, uh, summer of 2020. Um, it was a really hard summer in Portland. Uh, some of you probably know this area. Um, you know, it was really hot. You know, you know, historically hot um, and really uncomfortable. Uh, we had you know massive wildfires around the Pacific Northwest and up and down the West Coast, so the air was always 
you know, full of full of smoke, uh, smoke smell. Uh, the skies were, you know, odd, dark brown, rust color during midday, and if the if the wind was right, you know, little little ashes would float down, you know, from the sky. It was very apocalyptic. Um, we were in, we were still in, in the in the in the throes of the COVID pandemic and the COVID lockdown. Um, so people were already stressed by that as well and feeling cooped up cooped up in their homes and and they would one of the things people did to cope during covid of course was to go outside and to get out in nature and to get some fresh air and then that was taken away because of the smoke um and then people were concerned literally about the fires and possible evacuation and it was the election and it was a highly polarized election here so there's a lot of concerns about politics in Oregon and in the country and there was also the black lives matter movement was in full swing that summer and so there were in portland particularly a lot of marches and protests nightly downtown and big standoffs that were on the international news and helicopters you know hovering around the downtown every night it was just a really tough time uh and therapists were feeling it people were feeling it and so i came up with this image of what i call the upside down pyramid which is essentially feeling like there's this big pyramid over your head that's pointing at you so it's upside down and you have a little triangle of resources and coping skills but it seems just wholly inadequate to all the stuff that you're carrying and that was a way to kind of visualize and symbolize this stuff and get people to talk about it and work with it right so um the upside down pyramid you know you could draw it out if you want but it's essentially this this impinging pyramid much much bigger than this diagram it could, it could almost feel infinite you know all the things that could be going on um and it just does lead us to feel inadequate uh insufficient anxious despairing so it was a way uh you know for people to oh yeah that that helps me a little bit to to uh to, you know to, to see that and you all can think yourselves if we were doing a public talk in a room, I might have people who raise their hands like, how many people have experienced this, you know, upside down pyramid uh, scenario? And a lot of people might raise, you know, raise their hand because it's pretty common. And then the, then the question would be, what do we do about this? And this would lead us into more coping. And the way to work on this particular thing is to flip the pyramid around. It's kind of a reframe and flip the pyramid. We put it on its base now, all those things still exist that we were worried that we're worried about those challenges and issues. But let's just focus on our foundation for a second, like our own personal health or what I call our personal sustainability. You know, I'm part of the environment. I'm part of nature. So how do I take care of myself? Right. And that leads to interesting discussions about the, the bricks and our foundation, as I would say, um, you know, and the idea being if I can get my bricks sorted out and solid then I'm going to build, I'll have some organic energy to um, take on some of these issues because I do want people to work on things in the world and work for change and things like that. So this, this gives you a flavor of how I might work with someone in a meeting. And, and this turns into a long conversation because then it really depends on, okay, how do I take care of myself and how do I get rest and diet and exercise and my close relationships and my work and my hobbies and my spirituality or my art or my pets or my home, you know, all the things that make up our foundation. What does that mean to be healthy? Uh, are there missing bricks that I need to add? Are there some bricks that I need to take out that are not serving me? And then what, what exactly issues do I want to focus on? I like the idea that with the pyramid having a point because it kind of makes us sort of prioritize a little bit. I, when the pyramid is infinite, I, there's, it's hard to know where to begin. But, you know, part of this, part of this is like figuring out where do I want to start and what I want to work on them. So that's just a little preview uh, to give you, get us grounded. Um, and that's how I run the talk as well. Like this talk is really about building your foundation. I'm not going to share a ton of statistics about how bad the world is and, and climate issues and things like that. You all are intelligent people and you know how to access that information. I, um, I said, I, I joined the recent uh, former pre former Vice President Al Gore has a, has a program called the, the Climate Reality Project, which he's done for years. And it's really a good program. But I, I signed up for one of their trainings recently. And the first hour and a half was just Al Gore with slides talking about problems for a solid 90 minutes. And, um, you know, so that, <laughs> that information is out there if you want to access it. But we're going to talk about 
hoping ourselves, our identity and things like that, that I think is, is, is some good value for our time. Um, so, um, a little bit about me. I won't speak at length, but I'm originally from Buffalo, New York. Western New York State is where I grew up. It's where my 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 parents were from, where I still have a lot of family. Um, went to college in New York City. Um, came out west after college, and I've been out west ever since. So I'm kind of a West Coaster now, and I've been um, in the Pacific Northwest on and off since the '90s. And I've lived in Portland since 2002, um, and um, after college, I was interested in nature and travel and writing. And I came out West and I started working in outdoor therapy programs with young people. And that was sort of the first thing I did in my career. So I ended up spending time in Oregon and different parts of the West doing outdoor work. And I was a river rafting guide and I worked with Greenpeace for a while and I learned about environmental issues. And it was after that, that I, I had some mentors that were counselors and therapists and I worked for a program that was run by a psychologist, an outdoor program. And so these are some of my mentors that inspired me to study counseling and psychology and kind of got me on the path that I'm on now. This is a fairly unique path, um, less unique now than it used to be because there are more mental health people interested in this area. But when I was first getting started, there wasn't really much in the way of material. So you had to kind of make it up as you went along. Uh, but anyway, I've been doing this for a while and, um, working with people and doing academic work and teaching at Lewis and Clark graduate school in Portland and doing some research and some writing. And the world's kind of caught up with me for better or worse. And the issues that I've been working on are much more salient for people. Uh, so that leads me to where I am now. Um, but these, these are, these are insights that I've, I've cobbled together over the years that seem to work. Um, so that's kind of where this material is coming from, but I live in Northeast Portland. I have one daughter at age 15 um so i'm an oregonian here um and i won't say more about myself but you know you're free to ask questions or put things in the chat if you like um uh i'm seeing a message about audio low i should be okay with my volume but we can just see how that's going for people um i'm gonna keep moving on here um Yes, and Laurel mentioned my podcast, Climate Change and Happiness. I do that with a colleague from Finland. And that is is about climate change and emotions and people's feelings and thoughts about nature and the natural world. And that's what we talk about for 30-minute episodes. We've covered all kinds of ground. We just recently had an episode about trees and people's connections with trees, uh, which was quite good. And we've interviewed artists and therapists and people from around the world so it's 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 a thing to dip into if you're interested in this we're as we say we're all all climate all emotions all the time that's what that's what we talk about um so that's out there um and you know for our group i know it's a small group but if you want to do something by way of greeting you could you could access the chat and you could just say a little bit about where you you know who you are or where you live um Maybe something that uh, a, a positive thing about nature, the natural world that that draws you to this talk, you know, a strength or something you love. Um, you can also share some concerns that you have about nature, the natural world. So if you want to put in a little a brief message in the chat, just, you know, just a few words, that's always nice to see. Um, so feel free to do that. And then I might I might shout out at a, a few of you as we go. Um, but um be helpful for me also to hear a little bit about yourselves and and what's bringing you here um and then i'm going to introduce these other players so la weather i know not every one of you have read this novel but some of you have probably and it's quite a good novel um it's it's quite dramatic and it's kind of like a telenovela like there's all kinds of things that go on with this family in los angeles um but there is this backdrop of weather both in terms of the seasons of Los Angeles, but also climate change. Uh, and I won't, I won't put any big spoilers in my talk if you haven't read it, but, uh, but it, is, it is a nice example of how uh, climate change affect our personal life and our family relationships in interesting ways, right? So we have characters like the patriarch Oscar. I just pulled some pictures to, to, to symbolize some of these, these people for myself, but we have Oscar, the patriarch, and you know he's got a project uh, that's really, he's concerned about because of the drought that's really you know eating away at him. But 
for various reasons, he's unable to talk about it and get help from others. Not unlike people in the real world who carry things privately. Isolation is a big part of our, um, of one of the biggest challenges with eco angst or climate concerns is we carry it around ourselves and we don't have anyone to talk to. In the novel, there's some reasons why he's isolated, but this is a common thing. You know, and then there's Kayla, his wife, who's an artist and vibrant person and a chef and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, um, sort of understands Oscar's concerns about the weather and dust, but doesn't really understand, doesn't understand what's really eating away at him. And this is quite common as well. You'll see a lot of stories in the news about lately about couples and they have arguments and debates about like how they should have their behaviors about climate change or you know recycling or sustainability and to an article what i hear is that couple, couples don't know how to understand each other they they have not been given tools to talk about their environmental uh, values and their concerns and that's what i'm talking about today so you will have some tools by the end of this talk to talk to your partner if you like um Olivia, the eldest daughter, who's got a couple of young children and is dealing with a, a stressful life uh, as a realtor. So it speaks to the real world concerns that people have, even if they are environmentally minded, they've got bills to pay, they've got parenting, and they've got their jobs and their relationships. Um, you know, and she's also, um, there's a backstory about her and her own um um, fertility issues and challenges that she, that she had having children. And that's a big issue for people these days, for some people anyway, like questions about whether to have children or not and how that fits into their values and concerns about the world. And um, Claudia, the Claudia character is a, is a very a kind of celebrity chef, right? I believe keeping all these people straight, you know, and she symbolizes someone that's out in the world being successful, but in, you know, the food system is a big part of, sustainability and so where we get our food how we eat our diet our health you know how food is marketed so that's interesting um patricia i just like this picture i found it reminded me of the character patricia in the, in the novel but you know she's kind of someone like hey i'm busy i got a lot on my plate i know the earth is burning up but i don't want to hear about it that's that's like that's a common kind of response that someone has like I don't know. I don't know how I can help. And like, I don't want to read your petition and I don't want to donate. And, you know, that's a common uh, experience that people have. It doesn't mean they don't care. It's just that they don't really see how they plug in. And then Danny is a young, uh, young person in the story. And that really, to me, symbolizes a lot of my experience working with young people who are struggling and just working through all kinds of identity issues about who they are as people, Gender identity, sexual identity, racial identity, cultural identity, privilege, advocacy, taking, working on social justice issues, right? They've got all that stuff and climate angst as well, right? So there's a lot that young people are sitting with. So I'll cycle back to these characters a little bit, but it's nice to think about these examples because they all, and you all have your story too, but the, the book has a lot of nice examples of different characters. Um, so, you know, when I'm working with people or working with therapists who I train, it's kind of three steps in this work. And the first step is to work on our environmental identity, right? Now, that's a term you might not be familiar with, um, but you will be by the end of the talk because it's a big part of my talk. Our environmental identity is our sense of ourself uh, as a person in relation to nature and the natural world and other species and our pets and all that sort of stuff. And we know about other kinds of identities we have. We know about our gender identity, our sexual identity, our racial identity, cultural identity, regional identity. This is just one of the many identities that we have. But people haven't really been given a lot of tools to talk about their environmental identity. So sometimes they're not sure what they care about or what action they should take or why. So a big part of this work is really, before we take any action, it's just getting clear about our environmental identity because once we do, the actions tend to be clearer, right? Another step, particularly if someone wants to get involved, is is trying to adapt what we already know to work on things, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Every industry, every job, every every person has a role, often starting with what they already know and what they're good at, 
Now with young people, they, they can sometimes just, they're still starting. So they're going to be creating skills and we might re reskill ourselves, but I, I like to try to think about using what we already have because the challenge is not, is not that the challenge is how do we apply that in the world? If you're a librarian and you want to work on this issue in the library system, I don't know. You think about what's the system and what's the politics and what's the economics and what are my options? So every, every context is different. That's where that, that's where it gets interesting taking some action, even small action. Um, and it isn't, it isn't necessarily true that taking action is a solution for eco-anxiety. I've heard that talked about a lot. It can be. Uh, it's, it's, it's a solution or a help for eco-anxiety if the action is meaningful and it helps you to feel better about yourself. But forcing someone to take action or, or putting pressure on them can actually make them feel quite worse. And taking action that we don't understand and doesn't mean anything for us doesn't help and taking action and then failing and feeling worse doesn't help either. So action is important, but there are ways to take action that are a little more helpful. So I'll we'll talk about that a little bit, but it starts with having action flow from our, our environmental identity, right? Um, so some guidelines, I wanted to go into great detail, but when I do do talks, I like to just have some nice ground rules. Uh, this is things you can think about yourself as you do your own talks, right? We want to be transparent. We want to talk about ourselves. We want to talk about self-care like I did at the beginning. Like we're, We want to take care of ourselves here. We don't just want to beat up on ourselves. Uh, we want to be honest about our values and our fears and our feelings. And these are big tasks. So we want, to, we want to respect the bigness of this issue. Climate change, all these issues are broad, complex, ecological issues. They touch on many aspects of our society and many different levels of scale from your personal body to the planet, right? So it's easy to get off task and to get distracted. Uh, one of my metaphors is the climate elephant. You know, it's like uh, the climate change is like this big elephant. It's like the blind people and the elephant, the old, the, the old parable where the blind people find this elephant and some people end up by the, by the trunk and some by the tail and some by the legs and some by the, the side of the elephant or by the ear. And they all think it's a different kind of creature because they've only latched onto one part of it. Um, and that's how it is with climate change and these issues, because we see them from different sides. We see different aspects of them. Even people that are environmental ex experts will argue about the, the issue and what it is and how to, how to solve it. So the key with this is to be able to zoom out and realize, hey, we're talking about the same thing. You're focusing on technology. I'm focusing on politics. You're focusing on economics. You're focusing on spirituality. You're focusing on children. But we're all working on the elephant. So how do we work together? Um, you know, uh, or the Babel problem. It's like the Tower of Babel in the Bible, where everybody's talking about the same thing but using different words so they can't communicate. So there's there's a piece of this that comes out, and a lot of creative tensions about what direction to go. It's got, important to name that. Uh, and all environmental problems are justice problems. The worst impacts of climate change or any kind of environmental problem are generally uh, visited on people that have least wealth and privilege in society, whether it's in Oregon or Bend or Portland or anywhere in the world. So uh, a lot of people, for a lot of people, the elephant is the social justice issue. That is the issue, right? So it's important to name that. And we want to honor our emotions and personal stories. Um, people don't get a lot of chance to talk about this kind of stuff. So if we were in public, um, someone might just get up and just start going off on their story, you know, or they might yell or they might cry or whatever, because there's a lot of pent up energy around this stuff. So we want to kind of make room for that. Take care of ourselves and then come back on task because we can't talk about everything in an hour. So this is again around environmental identity and coping. So that's our focus. Um, so I talked about the elephant, the most vulnerable is Al Gore, who I saw the other day. The counties that are most vulnerable in the United States as a whole are mostly down in the Gulf Coast, Texas, um, Mississippi, Louisiana, because there's a confluence of looting industries that are already taxing people and poverty and ill health and obesity and race racism and structural issues. And they're super vulnerable to major destructive storms. So they're, they're kind of ground zero in the U.S. But we all have our as we'll talk about, we all have our, our vulnerabilities around the country. Um, so setting a frame, if any of you are counselors or therapists, you know that 
that term is used in counseling to kind of like, how are we going to talk? What's the, what's the rules? What's the box that we're going to work in here? Um, so some of the ways that I, you know, set the frame for talking about climate issues, when you can also put all this onto yourself and think about it, how it might be helpful for you. Um, one of my sayings is validate, elevate, create, validate the concerns, elevate them, put them on a pedestal and get creative about them. A lot of people dismiss their environmental concerns or they don't have a place to talk about them. But I want to I want to elevate them and say, this is important. This is the most for this moment. This is the most important thing. And let's get creative about this. What do you feel? Where did it come from? How did you learn about this? Sometimes we validate, elevate and educate. Like I need to get more information. You know, sometimes validate, elevate and delegate. I don't know how to do this. I need to get help. Uh, validate, elevate, and moderate. Hey, I'm I'm spinning out here. I need to take care of myself and and just do some deep breathing and put this in perspective. Sometimes I don't know what to what to go. So it's validate, elevate, meditate. I'm just going to be present with this, right? And this is something you could use for yourself. You can think about it when you have, if you're a parent or a teacher, right? Because this doesn't happen typically. A lot of things are dismissed, and you don't need to be an expert to do this. All you need to do is stay with the person, stay with their emotional expression. Validation has value. You know, that often if someone is validated, they say, okay, and then they can, they can, you know, you can brainstorm together about what directions to go. Um, so that's a helpful thing to think about, particularly if you're a parent. You don't have to have all your kids' answers, but you can think about them together. Um, and one of the insights that I do as a psychologist and what I know is that we have issues and issues is what I say. So we have the big, the big issues we want to work on, like in my pyramid, I want to work on social justice or, or poverty or, you know, foods, food systems or changing the economy or whatever. I have these big capital I issues I want to work on. Uh, and we also have our lowercase I issues, which is our own issues, our own baggage, our own stuff. You know, I'm, I have a tendency to overwork or I have a tendency towards substance abuse or I have a tendency toward being anxious or being depressed or I have ADHD or whatever, whatever your bag is, you know, whatever your stuff is, we all have our things. And so um, we want to kind of keep both of those in mind, right? Because uh, sometimes uh, someone's lowercase issues can get in the way of them achieving and being the person they want to be. So we want to kind of support people to take care of themselves. Um, that could include the pyramid, you know, taking care of yourself. So you have enough energy to take these things on. And then sometimes the big issues we work on obviously cause us to have issues. Like if I do too much doom scrolling in, on the news, I could start to get depressed. Or if I work really hard and get burned out and don't take care of myself, I could be fatigued and, you know, irritable about the work I'm doing. Right. So I can take the healthiest person in the world if I put them in a pressure cooker of working on big capital I issues for, for several months or several years and they don't have a lot of breaks and they don't take care of themselves, they're going to develop issues. So it's really about that balance. That's that personal sustainability kind of thing. So as I'm talking, I hope this washes over you and you can kind of think and get some insights about yourself. And I'm just going to keep rolling on, on this material. And if people have questions, you can pop them in the chat or something. Um, a growth mindset. If you're an educator, you might know about this idea, but it's the idea that uh, we can approach our challenges with a fixed mindset. This is we have a fixed set of abilities and we're good at some things and we're bad at others and we don't really change very much. Or we can uh, approach things from a growth mindset, which says, hey, I can grow new brain cells. I can learn new things. There's really, you know, with enough time and effort, we can learn almost anything, right? So people that are really good at things, it's mostly because they've done it for a while, it's not because they're, they're particularly special, right? So that's a great attitude to bring toward eco and climate issues because there's a lot of fixed mindset problems where people, this is the way society is, this is the way humans are, we've always been this way, you know? Once you start out with that fixed mindset, it's really tough to get anything done. But if you come out with a growth mindset, right? We could change. I can change. I can learn new things. Our society can learn new things. Our community can do different things, right? It's not a magic wand, but it does. Research shows that when people ad adopt a growth mindset, they typically do better on almost every task because they don't get thrown off when they have a setback and they generally just keep trying. And that's what we need to be working on. 
So growth mindset. Despair is fatigue in disguise. That's yet another one of my sayings. And that'll come up because I know when I'm feeling despair, I always check in with myself. I'm probably not, probably tired. I either had a long day or a long week or I haven't got enough sleep or something like that or I haven't exercised enough. So we really do want to take care of ourselves. I'm not, not saying despair is only fatigue. Obviously, there are feelings of despair, but when we're particularly dogged by them, we do want to check in on our personal health because that fatigue can put on despair lenses and we'll start to see everything like that. Um, and then we can we contradict ourselves. This this is this is a slide I used with some uh, college students recently. But you know, we want everything. You know, there's this idea of uh, you know FOMO is this idea of fear of missing out. So I want to do everything right. But there's eco FOMO. Someone was telling me about. I want to go to every lecture. I want to go to every webinar. I want to read every book. I want to see every Al Gore training. You know, we can't do it all, but we do have that eco FOMO. You know, we want to we want to be involved. And that kind of that kind of clashes with our I want to live simply. I want to take it easy. I don't want to do too many things, you know, you know, um, or you know, this YOLO or you only live once, right? So that's like just party up. The world's burning. So why don't we why don't we just party up, party like it's 1999, right? So we have these these different things. We want to we want to live simply and meditate and live small, and we also want to travel to bali and go surfing and on my instagram you know feed you know but so we, had to, we want to be gentle with ourselves you know th there's a lot of different people in the environmental movement is contradictory but as we'll as we'll talk about staying with our values is really key so being gentle with yourself staying with your values um and there's real life examples you know i was involved in a new york times story a year a little over a year ago you know, and there was elder type folks that I, that were parallel um, profiled that I worked with, that I've worked with, or that are kind of exemplars of this, you know, professors that have worked on climate issues and geography and geology for years. And they, 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 they worry about their grandchildren. They worry about their legacy. They worry about the world. There are mothers, young moms that are concerned about their kids and what's going to happen with them and weather and heat domes and fire and smoke um you know trying to nurse their young babies and afraid to go outside because of the smoke you know and then we've got young people who are highly educated and they want to know that their their concerns are taken seriously even from their therapists All right so there's a lot of different real life examples and um i'll keep going a little bit some more tools how to feel that's one of the tasks with this is like how do i feel and spending some time with that. Uh, when I'm working with people, I'll actually give them a feelings list and I'll say, let's look at some different feelings words and let's see what really is, is actually true for you around a certain situation. You know, um, for example, you know, there's a difference between being burned up, being cranky, being depleted, being edgy, being exhausted, being frazzled. They're all in that kind of uh, anxious, you know, fatigued category, but they mean slightly different things. So we want to kind of be careful about using the right words. Burned out is a is a word I I, I suggest people don't use very often because it's kind of a final word. When a house is burned out, you typically have to tear it down. But people can get burned out, but it's pretty rare. Most most of the time, they're just tired or fatigued or depleted. And depleted is different. Depleted is like a battery. It means I can recharge, you know, or weary or worn out. You know, if I lived a full day. You know, I'll be weary after this talk. I had a full day. I've been doing things all day. You'll you'll be weary at the end of the day. That's normal. Or ideally, we should feel weary after a full day. So we want to kind of be careful about not only the words we use for our feelings, but being judgmental about ourselves, try to be compassionate. And then uh, other things that I do with feelings around eco and climate issues is like, um, I ask people, what do you want to feel? You know, what feelings do you want to have? That's a radical question to ask yourself. Well, what do I want to feel about this? Hmm, I don't know. Let me think about it. When you ask yourself that question, usually three things happen. You'll say, I can't have those feelings. Those are those seem too far away. So those are what I call stretch feelings, right? I want to feel enthusiastic. I want to feel hopeful. I want to feel courageous. I want to feel gifted and smart. 
you know, okay, yeah, that might feel like a stretch, but that's okay. You can stretch toward those. Um, as soon as you name a feeling, you're more likely to have it. Uh, and then, you know, there are middle ground feelings that you can get to, like being present, being curious, being aware, being patient, being compassionate, being kind, right? Being vulnerable. These are kind of middle ground feelings we can typically get to at any time. Um, and then there are the protected feelings. There are feelings we don't want to feel. They 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 hurt. You know, we want to kind of build our capacity to to talk about those with other people and share them. So there's kind of different levels of of feelings. But um, you know, we're it's possible to feel all kinds of things. And feelings are kind of wild. So if I get myself in the right situation, I can feel a lot of positive feelings too. So we don't again, we don't want to have a fixed mindset about our feelings. We want to have a growth mindset. Right. So that's a, that's a piece to talk about. Um, reclaiming our nervous system. Uh, I love this collage of this this young woman. Uh, I'll talk about art briefly later, but art is so nice with this and like making collages is nice because you can kind of symbolize all the jumbled feelings and thoughts that we have. But that's where that pyramid comes in. You know, the reclaiming the nervous system is really figuring out, you know, what bricks do I want in my foundation in terms of my health and well-being? And that's going to ground me. We do have kind of like a stress thermometer in general and also around climate issues. And as the mercury rises in that thermometer, we get stressed, we get tight, we get tunnel vision. So, we, you know, we want to try to do things to keep our, our thermometer level a little lower. It's way a little more, more creativity. So again, that's, that's a conversation to have with yourself and with someone else because there's a lot of things that impinge on us. So, you know, having our priorities in terms of what we're, how we're going to spend our, our life and our day. One of the, one of the common things that comes up with people to remove from their um, pyramid base is a lot of excessive news watching. Now I'm not against watching the news in general. I'm talking about excessive news watching where the first thing you do in the morning is watching the news, watch the news, even before you're out of bed, you're on your phone and you're taking in that sort of, and you're checking it all through the day and you're spinning out on that. That is a recipe for disaster. So often, you know, pulling back and even taking a news fast or a news diet for a couple of days can be really helpful because like, I, you know, for me, the, the news is in my house. The news is in my street. When I open my door, that's the news. That's the news of our life. And we want to make sure we're getting that. For a lot of people, there's an imbalance. They're more focused on news of thousands of miles away. And, and not as much aware of their own bodies or their own their own lives. So we want to kind of recalibrate. So that's one example. You know, so you can think as I've been talking, I've been covering a lot of ground, but I think it's generally understandable to you. Um, and, you know, thinking about what's, what's hitting for you. Um, you know, if you were going to workshop these ideas more, you know, you could, have, you could talk to someone and say, okay, what's in your pyramid? What do you want to work on? in your foundation what do you think would be helpful you know those are the kind of directions to go or how are you how are you feeling how are you been feeling lately how do you want to feel right so that's 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 places to to take this you know in terms of our own lives you know uh and just getting some time like in this beautiful picture you know just to you know because when that person's as long as they're there because they want to be there and they got the right gear and they feel comfortable, their nervous system is going to calm down when they're on a nice lake like that. You know, and that's going to bring that, that stress thermometer down a little bit. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so I'll keep going. Um, um, personal climate impact report. So I'm going to talk about this. Then I'm going to talk a bit about environmental identity and get back to the uh, characters from the novel. And then we'll chat more openly. Um, but another thing I do when I work with people is I say, okay, you've seen these climate reports like the IPCC, these big climate reports out there in the world, these scientific reports, but what about your own climate report, like for your own life? And that's, that's a good thing to work on. It's not the first thing I would do with someone. I would want to give them some skills around feeling and stress reduction first. I don't want to just throw them into their, their climate concerns, but once we get a few tools, then it's good to kind of clarify what exactly is my climate or my climate issues. So I'll lead you through, this is a little bit of research that I've been involved in in the past, but I'll lead you through this uh, and you'll see what, what I mean. So when I was doing research on this 
you know, 10 or 15 years ago around climate change, we you know, found that there was like three kinds of impacts, right, with climate change and how it affects people's mental health. Um, so if you look at this, this diagram, like at the top, there's the inter interactions between climate and weather. Climate and it's different than weather. Climate we can't ever touch or see because it's this large aggregate idea, but the weather is what happens to us at any given time. But as you know, the climate affects the weather, which will then affect local places. Um, and there's three kinds of impacts, kind of three boxes of impacts. There's direct short-term impacts in, you know, in terms of disasters and issues that will happen in a place, floods, droughts, fires, things like that. That's one category of impacts. Another category is broad. And this diagram says psychosocial, but that means societal impacts. So it's like um, economic problems and chronic, you know, rebuilding issues after a fire or after a hurricane or heat related violence or conflict or migration or refugees, you know, social justice issues, you know, lack of access to safe, healthy environments, all that kind of stuff. Those are the broad societal impacts. Uh, and then there's the indirect impacts, which is just my feelings about it, even from a distance, even if I'm doing okay physically, I still might feel anxious or worried or depressed or in grief or shocked or traumatized, right? And it used to be that those indirect impacts were seen as kind of hypothetical, but that's not the case anymore. Everyone knows that, that this is happening. So there's kind of three boxes of impacts. And then... Um, so that's the disaster impacts, the ripple effects, and the emotions. Those are the three kinds of impacts. Um, and then, you know, there, there are mediators here, how I understand what I think about the world, where I get my news, that all affects how these things affect me and how I understand things. And then there are moderators. That's things that protect me, my wealth, my privilege, my location, my social supports, and things that put me in more harm's way poverty, mental health issues, other other issues. So so different, even in the same town, the people have different package of moderators, right? Some people are more protected, some people are not, right? So that's the big picture from the research. And then, you know, what's happening that's changed in the last few years is that all these impacts are happening closer and closer together in real time where we live. That's been that's what has caused this huge societal uptick in eco anxiety. This is no longer something that's happening far away in, in you know, in the in the Arctic or in, in a Pacific Island somewhere. It's, it's happening right where we live. All right. Um, so again, when you think about your own impacts, are they? Did, have you experienced disasters? Are you dealing with indirect disaster? You know, indirect impact societal, or is it more emotional? How bad is it? What are the ones to address? That these are questions to ask ourselves some people unfortunately have had direct disaster you know effects and that's what they think about uh uh for other people they're dealing with the economic or the ripple effects maybe because they work in agriculture or they they're in a business that that's affected or something like that uh and for other people they might be doing well and be protected but um they're really sitting with the emotional impacts, watching all this from afar, feeling powerless and all that other stuff. So once we once we start getting this information, we can think about our own report. So how do I understand climate and weather in my own place? Like, what are the trends? Uh, what is going to be happening? Uh, what impacts have I already experienced or might I be experiencing? Um, what are my risk factors and protective factors? And then, you know, how do I understand this stuff? What do I need to learn? Do I have any blind spots? Right. That could, then just gets into the coping, coping skills. You know, so I, I, I could say we have lenses and filters. Lenses help us to see things. Filters sometimes cause blind spots. Right. But this is where I would go. And it's a very objective kind of conversation. Um, it isn't just a lot of um, doomism. It's real conversation. Every place in the world is gonna have impacts of climate change. So it's really something to talk about. Or for some people, it's very comforting to have this conversation because they it brings them into the real world. They realize, okay, I have, I have these risks, but it's not happening right now and I can take action. So it kind of, it kind of reels them in from just broad, you know, vague concerns, right? Um, so again, taking stock, 
on your own climate stuff as I'm talking and where you've come from and what you're experiencing. Uh, and I'm not going to take a break. I'm going to plunge ahead uh, and talk a little more. Um, so I want to get this environmental identity topic on the table. Uh, environmental identity, your sense of yourself in relation to nature and natural world. We all have an environmental identity. Everyone does. And they're different and they're diverse. Some people don't know how to talk about it, but it's there. And it doesn't mean you're an environmentalist. Some environmental identities are really much more about um, uh, utilitarian views of nature, humans on top of the pyramid, and nature is there for us to use. That's a very common environmental identity that people have, right? And there are other kinds of environmental identities out there. One simple way that researchers measure people's environmental identities is just give them, they give them two circles, a circle for self and a circle for nature. And they ask people how close or far apart are these circles. For some people, self and nature is separate. For other people, it's kind of touching. For some people, slightly overlapping. For some people, it's quite overlapping. For some people, it's the same circle. They feel like themselves and nature is the same thing, kind of a sense of interbeing, even from a spiritual sense. Um, and that's all true. Those are all different ways that people think about self and nature. And it gets even more interesting because that's it's dynamic. Sometimes we feel more more connected and sometimes we feel more apart it depends on where we are if i'm having a super um special time peak experience out camping or out somewhere looking at the milky way in the desert i might feel really connected with nature and if i'm at my desk and at work or traveling and in a traffic jam i might feel so far apart so there's a kind of a trade environmental day people have and there's also it 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 it, it, it fluctuates right? so that's one way to think about it uh, another way that I help people define their environmental identity is to draw, draw a timeline of their life at all the different uh, pieces of their life that are related to nature and the natural world. It could be books they read, it could be teachers, it could be where they live, uh, places they travel to. And you all have an environmental identity timeline if you wanted to draw it out. You know, it, people often start with where they grew up and where they played when they were kids and the weather and the landscape and then where they went to school and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So there's all kinds of things on, on people's eco timeline, you know, pets, learning, mentors, parents, outdoor experiences, travel, books, movies, uh, TV shows, uh, ecological awareness, epiphanies, being a parent, if they're a parent, there's also fears and difficulties, losses, all kinds of things. But you, each of you have an eco timeline. And when I do an exercise like this with people in real time, they just, I can't, I have to pull them in because they just keep wanting to work on it because it's so interesting once you get into it. Um, um, and then sharing the timeline is interesting because you realize, oh, we have similar, similar backgrounds and differences. So it's a great way of understanding diversity, different diversity, social class and gender and things like that. Um, and then, you know, you can draw maps, have people draw maps and like have kids draw maps of where they live and, people draw maps of where they've traveled this is a really neat map that one of my students had done um that kind of was their whole life journey based on different places so people can very get very elaborate about their their maps but this is kind of a you know a, a, a representation of someone's environmental identity based on their life experience um and you can do a family tree diagram with your parents and grandparents because everyone in the diagram also has an environmental identity, right? My father has one, my mother has one or had one or my grandparents, different. Most people don't talk about this, but it can be really interesting to think about that. And this is helpful sometimes when people either have a, a good connection with their family and it's a source of strength or it helps when people are just uh, disconnected from their family because of different values and beliefs. So. There's different ways that the environmental identity uh, concept can come about. Um, and then values, you know, um, we have different, we have different values, but people tend to start from the same three places with environmental concerns, either concerns about their own self, egocentric values, concerns about others, altruistic, or concerns about the earth, right? So no matter what your environmental um, attitude is, it's going to start with one of these values. So that's another place to start. And that's kind of helps us to understand our environmental identity. So I'm going to 
going to move up a little bit. Uh, another another part of our environmental identity is our connection with nature in terms of actual places. And so there's a whole spectrum of nature from what I would call virtual nature, which would be representations of nature, like this picture behind me or even a video game and domestic nature, like plants and pets and things in our home and nearby nature, like parks and gardens and managed nature, like forests and farms and agricultural areas. And then wild nature, like, you know, the woods and the mountains and the ocean. And there's all different ways to check in with nature from the spectrum. And people, some people travel the whole spectrum. Some people really are more focused on one part of the spectrum, but that's another part of our environmental identity. So obviously like gardeners and wilderness adventurers are different subgroups in our, in our culture and farmers and video gamers, right? So there's different identities around nature. Uh, and then there's all the access and environmental justice issues. Justice issues will come up with this. Um, so I'm going to skip over eco-anxiety because I've been checking on that. And I'm going to go, bear with me here, keep going. I'm going to go to this action question here. And then we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about the characters in the, in the novel uh, a little bit. And then we'll, then we'll dialogue. Um, but people often ask me like, what should I, what action should I take? Um, and uh, one way to think about it and one exercise I'll do with people is I'll have them just, if we were, we, if we were all together, uh, sorry, it's really nice, but this beautiful sunset is coming into my, coming into my office here. Um, um, if we were all together in a room, I would say, okay, we're going to do an exercise. I want everyone to stand up. I want you to line up in one line in front of the room, right? And in this direction is the blockade, the direct action, the environmental activism, right? It's dangerous, it's loud, it's smoky. There's a barricade, There's there could be legal action, risks. And then this is the other direction, this is behind the lines, right? And I want you to line up on how you, where you feel like you are on that spectrum. Right. And it makes people think about, well, what, what is the spectrum and what is my activity and what is my style? Right. And so some people are kind of frontline people and they want to go to the front line on things. Right. So like uh, um, if when we're finding your place on the line, some people want to go right to the front and that's kind of like the direct action kind of thing. This is a picture from the Kodax, the Coda um, access pipeline um, a protest and um you know that is a place to be and we need people on the front lines of all kinds of direct action right but when you put people in the exercise they'll they'll tell you why they're in the front or the middle or the back and they always have good reasons you know some person says i'm a frontline person i'm going to be right there i'm not concerned about my safety i'm going to put myself out there other people will say well i'd like to be on the front line but it's not really my style and i've got so i'm going to help i'm going to be close to the front line other people say well you know, I'm going to use my marketing skills to do websites or posters or things, you know, or someone says, well, I'm a parent and I've got young children, so I'm going to be toward the back, but I'll be supporting, right? So the, the, the takeaway with this exercise is that there's a place for everyone in the line, right? Um, yes, there's the front, the front direct action people, but there's people to support those people and there's design and messaging and social media and fundraising and politics and arts even just simply bearing witness, you know, growing food, teaching, caring for children. Um, so that's an, yet another variation on the um, environmental identity is our action identity. And, and over time, if you've had, if you've been on the planet long enough, you realize, oh, you end up standing in different places, different times in your life, right? We're not always in the same place, you know, so there's a time for being you know, this this whole exercise, like a lot of these, is 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 um is hypothetical. We know from a social justice standpoint, some people don't have a choice; they have to be on the front line. Or there, someone might say, "Hey, I'm on the front line every day, just surviving." So that's true. Um, but some of us do have a choice, um, or we evolve. You know, when I was in college, I was involved in protests around apartheid in South Africa and things, and I was very much a front line person. 
you know, when the protests were, were happening in Portland a couple of years ago, I was supportive and I was aware, but I, I was a parent and I wasn't able to go to those things and it wouldn't have been safe for me to go. I couldn't afford to be arrested or, you know, be hurt. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll make our decisions about when we're going to be involved or not. But again, it, it's been, a, it's, it's a big insight for people, particularly young people to realize, oh, there are different places to stand and I have a choice and I'm going to move around in my life. Because sometimes people think I'm there again, that's fixed mindset thinking, right? Oh, I'm just this, but in a growth mindset, well, I'm going to be in different, different places. And there might be a place when it's right for me to be on the front line. So that, that kind of a, is an action conversation. And then that comes back when we talk about your pyramid and what you want to work on and all that kind of stuff. So I hope this gave you, is giving you a flavor of this work, right? I've got, we've got some time and we'll talk a little more, but I wanted to kind of cut to the chase a little bit. Um, Cause part of it is extending your timeline, right? So I've got this, this timeline, but what, what am I going to do next? But if you don't know what you've done in the past, it's hard to know what you're going to do next, right? So you want to kind of think about your, your identity and try to think about what's authentic from my actions to flow from this, right? So it's a larger conversation, but something good to reflect on. You know, then back to the weather in Los Angeles and the novel um, and all the good food. That's the one, one of the takeaways from the, the novel is that I want to go to Mexico and eat food because of all the different great food that's in the, in the novel. But again, these characters, right? Oscar, you know, he's got an environmental identity. You know, he has ancestors that were landowners, Mexico, and he's got this sense of history and legacy like elders. And he's a big part of this novel is he's, he's concerned about his legacy and how he's going to be seen and what, how, how he's going to support his family. And he's got his pride and his own masculine pride and everything. Um, so that's a big part, you know, of this kind of thing. Uh, helping him with his environmental identity and figuring out how to communicate and not to be isolated and talk about his values, right? Why is he concerned about the drought and the weather and the land, right? Um, how can he communicate with his wife? Because even with if a couple can say, okay, we have three kinds of values, personal, egocentric, altruistic, and biocentric, those three, where do you line up on this issue and where do I line up? That could be so helpful because what happens in a couple, they might be clashing because one person's channeling the egocentric self-protection. The other one's concerned about other people or one person is really more concerned about other animals. You know what I mean? But if I don't understand that, it's hard for me to validate the other person. And I find most couples, once you do that, they realize, oh, we're, we're on the same team. We generally agree on these things, but on any particular issue, we might gravitate toward one or another of the of the pieces, you know, and uh, part of the novel is, you know, this reconciliation with uh, um, Oscar and Kayla and how Kayla then becomes part of Oscar's team. They become on the same team, you know, about their values and, and environment. And, and it doesn't happen until the end of the novel. That's interesting to see how that plays out. Um, you know, and then Olivia, um, you know, is a great example of <laughs> capital I and lowercase I. She's got her things she's working on in the world is she's got to deal with her marriage and her children and her own self and sort all that kind of stuff out. Uh, so she can be supportive of her family. Um, and then of course she has, uh, she has alliances with her sister. They make it, they, they figure out about some child, child plans that they have. Right. Um, and, you know, Claudia has an injury and she has to re, you know, has to think about a life change. And she also has really, you know, everybody has relationship stuff in the novel. Um, but, you know, she is exemplifies someone. It isn't particularly environmental in the novel, but she exemplifies someone who changes course and takes on a whole different life. And that happens sometimes around this stuff. People will do different things and they'll actually change their career to do different things based on their environmental concerns. And, um, you know, Patricia is dealing with a lot of her own demons and things like that. And she also exemplifies like the, the lowercase and the, and the uppercase I, and she's got to sort of sort out some of her own personal issues. So then she can kind of take action and support her sister and support her family. And also she's, a, she's a parent as well. 
Um, so she's supporting her um, son uh, who is going through his own identity development. And, you know, he, he, his character isn't quite as developed as some of the adults in the book, but obviously he would have concerns and thoughts about climate and environmental issues and, and things like that. But in the novel, he's, he's, he's often more focused on his own personal identity and gender identity, stuff like that. Right. So but you can see how all of the characters in the novel would benefit from understanding each other's eco timeline and understanding their values and understanding their pyramid and taking care of themselves. A big part of the novel is the family is collectively figuring out their, their pyramid and working on the base and sorting all this stuff out. So um, that is kind of my content when we got some time. 